<laughs> Hello, good evening. Welcome back to another Eye Care for Your Brain with Dr. Sullivan, board certified neuropsychologist. That is me. Ah, I'm very happy to have arrived here today. Uh, we are here on Wednesdays at 6 to bring you free brain health lectures. I try to focus on different brain health populations, different challenges that are common in our brain health community. And tonight my focus is on a movement disorder and this is dystonia. This is something that I have wanted to talk about for quite some time and my recent research into gut health and brain health led me to an article that I thought was useful and would be something that would uh, educate and empower those of you out there uh, living with dystonia. This is a 2021 article published by the American Society for Microbiology. Uh, more and more research is coming out literally every week about the power of gut health. And what it really is focused on is something uh, in the, the gastrointestinal tract called the microbiome, which is the just trillions and trillions of colonized bacteria. There's also viruses and fungus and all this other stuff. Um, but what we typically think about is kind of good and bad bacteria. And so what the microbiome is, is really this balance of, of all these trillions of cells between kind of the good and helpful bacteria, the ones that promote anti-inflammatory responses, the ones that promote good digestion, the ones that promote good mood, and the bad ones. The bad ones are very self-centered and they are really there to just simply multiply and take up space. So gut health is this really um, interesting, important area of brain health that I have become more and more interested and committed to because it represents power and control and a way to influence brain health by what we eat. So what we now know about gut health is it can absolutely exacerbate different neurological conditions. It's very clearly related to mood, especially depression. It's related to our ability to manage stress. And we certainly see that it makes different brain health challenges um, more symptomatic. So we've seen this in Parkinson's disease, probably has the most research. We've also seen some evidence of it in stroke. I would say that's the next one. And then we've got these smatterings of research as it relates to things like essential tremor, um, things like multiple sclerosis and even Alzheimer's disease. So what we're gonna talk about tonight is introduce the idea of dystonia. I want you to understand the motor symptoms and also the non-motor symptoms. And so many of you know me through my four hour webinar on essential tremor that was strictly focused on non-motor symptoms and dystonia is no different. So what do I mean by non-motor symptoms? Well, we can contrast them to motor symptoms. Motor symptoms, of course, are the observable parts of a movement disorder. So tremor, in the case of dystonia, we're gonna talk about involuntary muscle twitching, uh, contractions, uh, muscle spasms. Uh, things that are objectively testable, that a neurologist can look at you and see. As a neuropsychologist, I am passionate about the non-motor symptoms. So what happens within the human that is just as real, just as legitimate, but can't actually be relied on with objective measures? So these are things like cognitive changes, changes in attention, memory, word finding, but also changes in mood, right? Our ability uh, to manage our mood when we have a brain health condition isn't just necessarily from living with a chronic condition. Certainly that's part of it, but for many, many neurological issues, there are hardwired mood, cognitive, and sensory issues. So that's an area that I really like to help people understand because what I worry about is for so many of you, when you go to your typical neurologist, you are just being uh, assessed on your physical symptoms and you're living with the non-motor symptoms, but no one is talking about it and no one's saying, hey, uh, in the case of dystonia, what we're gonna talk about tonight is depression, really major depression, recurrent major depressive disorder seems to be an independent part of dystonia, not just a reaction, a kind of like a social reaction to having a movement disorder, of course, 
that you were all human, that's a part of it too, but the research is there to suggest the same parts of the brain that are impacted in dystonia are also responsible for other non-motor things. And that's really how it goes with all these movement disorders, right? In essential tremor, we know that the cerebellum is making a major contribution. Well, guess what? The cerebellum isn't just responsible for intention tremor, right? It's also responsible for the coordination of our words, our emotions, our eye movements, so many different things we talked about in our Essential Tremor webinar. Very uh, parallel concerns with orthostatic tremor, which is another population um, I care about a lot. The non-motor stuff is just so important to talk about because it makes people feel not crazy and it gives them solutions. And if we only have a one-dimensional approach to movement disorders, we're missing a whole other part of people's lives that we could validate and improve if we only kind of made it a legitimate player at the table. So dystonia is definitely a complex movement disorder involving involuntary muscle contractions, kind of think of it like muscle spasms, um, but also for many people, a little bit of a tremor. It's the third most common movement disorder. So essential tremor is the most common, then Parkinson's disease, and then dystonia. Uh, it can cause slow, repetitive twisting motions. Uh, it definitely doesn't have the high frequency tremor that we think of with uh, pardon me, with essential tremor or Parkinson's disease. It can affect one part of the body, which is what we call a focal dystonia. Uh, if there's two or more parts of the body that get um, moved together, we call that segmental dystonia. Or you can also have general dystonia, which is kind of your whole body. The most common is cervical dystonia, which happens in our neck. It's contractions that cause our head to turn and to twist to one side, kind of pulling forward or pulling back. And oftentimes this causes pain for people. We can also have dystonia that affects the face, specifically the eyelids. Many people have jaw or tongue dystonia. Plenty of people have what we call spasmodic dystonia. Tonia, which is more of the voice box or the vocal cords, and the hand is a very common place. One of the unique things about dystonia that we find is that after a long period of a repetitive activity, people can get focal dystonia. So a classic example is writer's cramp, right? You can have someone who goes away to the cabin to write their you know, memoir and after six months of being locked away and writing and writing and writing every day, all of a sudden their hand kind of turns and starts to twist. Some people also have abdominal dystonia, which can be responsible for that internal tremor sensation. I've been thinking about that a lot because I know many of you um, have found me on YouTube or Facebook because of my internal tremor uh, Facebook lecture. So dystonia definitely gets worse with stress and when someone's tired, much like any movement disorder. And it can range from mild to severe. It can definitely be painful and cause physical disability. And over time, it's really interesting. What we think is it does become more noticeable, but there are certain types of dystonia that are not considered to be degenerative, which is different than the box we put Parkinson's or essential tremor in. Uh, depending on the type of dystonia people have, depending on the severity, it can certainly interfere with your physical abilities, your vision, remember I said before eyelids, um, swallowing, if you've got something going on with your voice, pain, fatigue, because your muscles are constantly contracting. And then of course, how does the human respond to all these things? So sure, we also see signs of social withdrawal and depression and anxiety. But we also do see that depression as a standalone symptom. So uh, dystonia can happen on its own, or it can also go hand in hand with other movement disorders and other injuries. So Parkinson's, Huntington's, traumatic brain injury, stroke, oxygen deprivation, infections, tuberculosis, um, sometimes even heavy metal poisoning or reaction to certain medications. The cause of dystonia is not super well understood, but what we know is that it's at least related to two different things. One is dysfunction in different parts of the brain that are connected through circuits, okay? And I'm gonna teach you what we think the two big ones are in a minute. And also changes in brain chemicals called neurotransmitters. So the part of the brain that's most impacted long-term in Parkinson's is the basal ganglia, which is a 
kind of a set of little structures deep in our brain that are responsible for movement and other things like cognition and mood. So we think that's impacted in most dystonias, but also a circuit that has a very long name. But if you have this, I want you to know because I, I believe that's your right. So this is the cortico-striatal thalamocortical circuit. And what all those little root words mean is that that's the different parts of the brain that are involved. So some things are related to the outside gray matter where you think of the bumpy slimy stuff. And some of those are deep in the brain and what we call the white matter. So it's a disorder that really ranges in different parts of the brain as opposed to something like essential tremor that we think is pretty pretty well connected within the cerebellum, even though there's circuit issues related to the frontal lobes, this one seems to be a little bit more widespread or distributed. We also think that there's abnormalities in neurotransmitters, and this is where the gut issue comes in. So we know that dopamine, serotonin, GABA, acetylcholine, and norepinephrine are all involved. And what those neurotransmitters do varies, but at their core, they help different parts of the brain communicate. So it's, it, you can kind of understand there's a chemical problem and there's probably also a connection problem. So as I said before, much like every movement disorder I've ever studied, there are unseeable, unknowable things unless you are that person. If you are a person living with dystonia, you tell me if I get the next few things right, okay? So the reason these are real is because the similar, uh, same parts of the brain do all sorts of different things. If you've been to any of my webinars, you know that one of the most enlightening uh, brain health insights I ever learned that I try to teach you is that most parts of the brain really do three different things. There's really triplicate responsibilities. So one is a motor function, meaning something with the body. Number two is a cognitive thing, a thinking or processing or memory thing. And number three is emotional. And so when you have damage in any part of the brain, it's more common than not, way more common than not, that you're going to have issues in three different categories. The problem is we're lopsided in the way we approach brain health today and we over-focus on the physical, on the visible. We need to get more caring, compassionate, sensitive, observant about the non-motor stuff. So here's what we see in non-motor symptoms in dystonia. Okay, the first thing is that we see there's sensory issues. So sensory meaning the pain that can come along with dystonia, about 70% of folks with Vocal dystonia, especially the cervical kind, report pain. 30% report pain when they have focal hand dystonia. People who have dystonia in the research literature have been found to be two times lower in their pain threshold. So they actually, over time, become less and less sensitive to pain. So when someone with dystonia is telling you they hurt, they probably are actually experiencing two to three times more the amount of pain than it might take um, someone without it. When uh, one research study looked at 89 consecutive people that came into a neurology clinic who were diagnosed with dystonia, so that means they just took 89 in a row who came, so there wasn't any special selection, about 57% of them met criteria for a mental health disorder. Now this is in comparison to about 24% if you were to just ask an average uh, person coming to any doctor's appointment. And the most common is recurrent major depressive disorder. Now here is a fact I thought was very interesting and helpful for those of you who live with this. On average, the depression preceded the dystonia, meaning it came earlier, on average, anywhere between 18 years before and 14 years after. So I'm thinking of the you know month and year your dystonia starts. For many people, it ranged all the way from 18 years before or 14 years after. So there's a wide range in there, but the fact that many people had their major depression first is being used by neuroscientists as a clue to maybe understand what exactly causes dystonia. What is very important is that they ruled out a lot of other factors that could be causing the depression. So they were able to say it didn't matter how old the research people were, didn't matter how long they had dystonia, didn't matter how bad they had dystonia, didn't matter if they had Botox, they were able to kind of minimize any other factor that might have been the reason these people were um, getting depression. And even when people got on some successful treatments, 
for dystonia, meaning their motor symptoms reduced, they were still reporting the same amount of depression. So uh, causal, but um, not necessarily hand in hand. So interesting. We also see a concentration deficit, and this is where I come in as a neuropsychologist. So this is often a finding that I uh, report in when I see someone clinically in my practice is that dystonia is very distracting to a person, right? Abnormal movements, pain, they take us away from the present moment. We only have but so much attention. We can focus on the here and now. If we are distracted by things happening in our own body, that is definitely a part of it. But it's also likely, uh, because we know attention happens, in a very broad way in the brain, attention concentration is only possible when different parts of the brain work together. That's why it's such a common symptom across uh, attention deficit, across stroke, across so many things that happen in the brain, take one part of the brain and disconnect it from the rest of the brain. And so there's not that very smooth, rapid coordination across different parts of the brain. So that's a very common finding across many, many different brain health conditions. Impaired sleep, people with dystonia have reduced REM sleep. In REM sleep, we do so many important cleaning projects in the brain. We're really getting rid of a lot of waste that builds up throughout the day. People with dystonia tend to wake up a lot more throughout the night. In part, it's because of the dystonia. It doesn't stop for some people when they go to sleep. So sleep disturbance has its own negative cascade in the lives of folks with dystonia. There have not been any double-blind placebo-controlled studies of any medications for the non-motor symptoms. So we don't know hardly anything in a population type way what works for depression and dystonia, what works for sleep and dystonia. We really don't know, despite how influential these things are in quality of life. So please join me in saying, give me a thumbs up or a heart, whatever you'd like, that we need a new model of this disorder, very similar to essential tremor, very similar to orthostatic tremor. We have to validate the non-motor symptoms. If we just keep talking about these things like they're a tremor disorder or worse yet, a benign uh, essential tremor, we're never going to uplift the brain health community. It's, it's just minimizing what they live through much too much. So you might be wondering by now, hey, Dr. Sullivan, I thought I was tuning in for a gut health dystonia talk. We're, we're getting there, we're finally getting there. So how does this all come together? Well, the first thing you have to know is that there are over 500 million brain cells that live within the wall of your gut. How amazing is that? So wrap your head around that. There are many, 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 many millions of brain cells that live outside the brain. That is absolutely newsworthy. The neurons that in our, are in our gut are very, very tightly packed in the large intestine, okay? Um, they are hardwired to excrete neurotransmitters like dopamine, like uh, a serotonin, but they also, the gut is also connected to the brain by the longest cranial nerve called the vagus nerve, which literally goes through the chest wall all the way down into our large intestines and communicates back and forth to the brain about the state of health in our gut and the brain acts accordingly. So it's absolutely fascinating bi-directional communication system. And there's a lot that happens related to inflammation and neurotransmitters. So about 95% of the body's supply of serotonin, which I've already taught you is related to dystonia in some way, happens in the gut is so amazing so if you think of you know if you take an antidepressant or someone you know the most common symptoms people have are gi symptoms right things that happen in our belly that don't feel very good that makes a lot more sense when you understand you're, you're basically affecting what happens in the gut so much of what gets communicated back to the brain about, you know, is there a problem in the gut? Is there inflammation? Are there things happening here that shouldn't? Is all about that microbiome, okay? It's all about the balance, the delicate balance of gut bacteria, which is very largely shaped by what we put into our body every single day. So the reason this is so hopeful of a topic for those of us who care about the brain is it's a new way in to affect brain health. It's a new intervention. We all know exercise helps the brain. We all know, you know, uh, eating well affects the brain, but this is a new evidence-based way 
of affecting brain health. Okay, so so the study, the, the thing that got me set off on this topic anyway, was 57 people, right? So this is the Journal of Microbiology. They took uh, 42 men, 15 women. The average age of onset of their dystonia was 45 years, give or take about 12 years. Importantly, they were drug naive. So what I mean by that is these people were not on any type of medication. So we know that the results aren't affected in any way by any type of pill. And they compared them against 27 people who did not have dystonia. And they did genetic sequencing of their stool samples uh, and also looked at the neurotransmitters um, in both groups. And what they found was that there was more of one type of not so good bacteria called colostrol in the dystonia group. So colostrol, bacteria in the gut is uh, unbelievably diverse. You can have one type of bacteria that acts different when it's in low concentrations as opposed to when it's in high. Uh, how influential it is on health has to do with the big picture. So how does one bacteria interact with another bacteria? It depends where in the gut it is. It depends the health of the person. It depends, um, the, there's so, this is why while gut health is super interesting, it's a very challenging area of research and future therapeutics because everyone is so different and the gut microbiome changes so rapidly. It changes every time we poop. So it, it's, it's something that you need to be aware of, but it's really, an, when you're committed to gut health, it's very much an everyday kind of a thing. So what they found is that folks with dystonia had more of this bad bacteria called colostrol. So this is a very dominant bacteria in our gut. Um, when it is too high, when the bad takes over the good, it can lead to metabolic dysfunction, which means chemicals get out of whack, and that's when we can have symptoms, right? So we have GI symptoms. Very often when we have GI symptoms, there's also some communication happening to the brain that there's inflammation, that the immune system should be working overtime. And, and this is really what a lot of scientists believe is at the heart of autoimmune issues, is at the heart of mood disorders. And for some brain health challenges, Parkinson's in particular, there is a lot of writing that maybe the cause of Parkinson's is when a genetic predisposition meets something that happens in the gut. I haven't read enough compelling evidence to suggest that's the case with dystonia or essential tremor or the static tremor. But what I do believe after doing my research and preparing for my gut health webinar last month is that gut health and what you eat is an opportunity to reduce the intensity of your brain health symptoms by how much, I don't know, we're still figuring that out. Um, but also it is a way to calm your nervous system. And so any of you listening who have any brain health challenge, if you also have a GI issue, so GI issues typically involve motility. So stuff either moves too slow or it moves too fast. If you have any one of those problems, this is the most important thing for you to educate yourself about right now. Couldn't be more important because you might think you're making healthy decisions for yourself every day with your diet, but what you might learn once you understand a truly gut healthy diet is you should be making different choices. So one of the ways we can get this colostrol into our brain uh, through our gut is through beef. So beef, and especially when beef is not cooked well, oftentimes the spores in this bacteria are not killed by the heat and they can get inside our gut. Now what's kind of scary about these spores is they are pretty antibiotic resistance until we bring in the real big guns. Bacteria, like I said, has many, many different jobs. So with this specific bacteria, this is where we can get tetanus, botulism, right? So that's in its most extreme. In its most lower levels, we can have some of those motility issues with our gut, just like feeling bloated or feeling like your, your tummy just isn't feeling quite right. So they found too much of that. They also found too little of a good bacteria called Bacteriodetes, B-A-C-T-E-R-O-I-D-E-T-E-S. And what they found is that this is a good bacteria that was underrepresented. So when a bacteria is good, um, the best part of what it does for us is it creates these molecules called short 
chain fatty acids that sit around in our large intestine and basically communicate back to the brain through the vagus nerve um, that there's no problem here. We don't need a, a you know, fire truck to come in and put out this inflammation. It can also help modulate um, reactivity of the nervous system. So this is where we can kind of get that calming instead of being in a hypervigilant intense state. They also found in the genes of people with dystonia that they had um, more activity in synthesizing tryptophan, which is a precursor to serotonin, than people who didn't have dystonia. What to make of that? I honestly don't quite understand that. Um, but what this research definitely helped me understand is that for some people with dystonia, they have a gut imbalance that is contributing to their symptoms, right? And this is part of how we can kind of make a line in the sand of folks who struggle with this and, and folks don't. We, this is the first paper I've ever read that's connected dystonia to gut health. So this is not a map forward. This is more like a seed of an idea and really should be motivation for those of you in this community to learn more about gut health, okay? Um, there was a, a couple other studies I found out there. Um, the, the ones that were most compelling to me are in Parkinson's disease. And what they basically find is that when you do fecal transplants in this group of movement disorder folks, and you put more good gut bacteria into their body, that their symptoms decrease. We've also seen one case study at least where someone's essential tremor pretty much went away. And so what I found in the literature is that these are at this point accidental findings. It's doing a fecal transplant on someone because they have a GI issue, and oh, by the way, when they come in for follow-up, they're not shaking as much. So what I think we're gonna see in a very, very near future is high quality, high, uh, reliability designs where we actually get a chance to look at people with different movement disorders and figure out how realistic are fecal transplants as the way forward. Um, I think it's uh, very promising. I know it's kind of weird to wrap your head around the idea of getting a poop transplant, but hey, <laughs> stranger things have happened in life and if it helps, I, you know, I would be very curious actually for those of you watching if you would do that if it was available. So this is very much the beginning of a new line of research. Um, and it really just begs the question of why aren't we talking more about diet when we go to our neurology appointments, right? This is not a common question. You know, how often do you eat fermented foods? How much yogurt do you eat? Um, what's your ratio of fresh versus processed foods? These should be just as common as how often do you exercise or do you smoke? So one of the things you can do as an advocate is when you go to the doctor, you can bring up gut health. Ask them if they keep up on that literature. Ask them what they might recommend to you as somebody with condition X. Where should I go from here? So I always like to give very practical recommendations after we discuss research. So I went hunting this morning on if this uh, colostrum bacteria um, is too high, how is it that we might reduce it? What is a recommendation that would actually be science-based? So there's nothing out there as it relates to dystonia. Um, and what I did find was that um, the oral antibiotics are very good at treating kind of the, the bacteria itself, but not very good at treating the spores. So you might, it basically would be a self-perpetuating cycle of taking an antibiotic. When you're done, the spores just regrow. But there is a lot of evidence about using food as medicine. And this is the topic that has just consumed me for the last few months. Some of you were with me in the two and a half hour gut health webinar that we've been offering. If you haven't seen it, I truly think it's my best work. Um, I'm very proud of the four other webinars that we have, which is a little different than when you see me here. We've been doing Facebook lectures for five years. It's only been in the last couple of years that I offer much longer um, brain health seminars where you can see my PowerPoint and you get to see my visuals and it's a lot more dynamic. Um, if that's something you think would be helpful to you, please go to our website at icfyb.com slash gut. That's I care for your brain slash gut. It's two and a half hours of a lecture. There's bonus content with trackers for what you should actually be eating. Uh, the 10 powerhouses and we have kind of a seven day challenge where people, you might be surprised what actually qualifies as a gut healthy um, diet. 
it is um, a topic that I just really have so much enthusiasm about and we'll be talking about more here on Facebook. If you are um, in any dystonia groups on Facebook, Facebook is such a wonderful resource for different communities to get to know um, about their challenge and not have to reinvent the wheel. If any of you are on dystonia groups, please, please, please share this. It's, it's information that I just really, really think people would benefit from. I am off uh, for vacation tomorrow. I will be back, I think, in about two weeks. Uh, and let me know if there's anything else you would like me to talk about. Thank you guys so much. And I really look forward to uh, future conversations like this with you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.